Welcome to the Baseball Polynesia Podcast. My name is Rob Pennant, and I am thrilled that you're here. In this episode, you are going to hear a conversation between myself and Charlie Sale Solaita. He shares some great insight on when he started playing baseball, what it was like during his high school career, and then also he shares some feedback on what it was like and the things that he had to deal with as a college baseball player in a foreign territory, foreign area. He grew up on the island, but then he went to college at a private school all the way out in Michigan, the cold winter nights of Michigan. So I'm thrilled that you're here and you'll get to experience this conversation and I hope that you're encouraged and motivated by Charlie Sales Olaita's story. Here you go. All right, here we go. Hello. Charlie. Charlie, Taco Bell. <laughs> 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 Can you hear me okay? Yeah, man. Wally Gums. <laughs> cool, man. How how you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I mean, just just sitting here relaxing on the on the couch. <laughs> all right, all right. So what? hey, man. Um, it's been a while since we talked, and I shared with you the idea about the baseball, etc. And my hope is that this conversation will be a time where we can reminisce about your story in baseball, how you grew up playing, um, coming up under your uncle, Tony's uh, tutelage, and then how, whatever you want to share. Um, but the ultimate goal is to share your story. And I'm sure a lot of people are unaware of the twists and turns that you've uh, had to go through in order to be where you're at, but also to achieve some of the successes that you've been able to achieve in baseball. I know that was a mouthful, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know where to start, but um, I mean, I think. Well, we could start from the um, beginning, dude. I think that would be best is, um, you know, when did you start playing? How did you start playing? You kind of grew up in the bloodline of baseball with the Solaita, you know, with your, your uncle being the first major league baseball player um, from Samoa or Samoan blood, right? right? So that's the Solaita yeah. family. And and you just kind of came up under it, yeah. So well, tell us yeah, about yeah, how that started for you. Well, baseball, yeah, like you said, baseball has always been in the family, and um, you know we all grew up playing baseball. Uh, but I remember a long time ago, we actually started in San Francisco, and um, the thing, I, the things I remember about San Francisco was um, was later, well. I'm, I'm going to fast forward and go back, but later in life, I realized kind of how I grew up. I, you know, we had, we realized that at, I realized later on in life that at that time, um, you know, uncle Tony, he was always, um, he had like his off seasons and he would always come back to San Francisco and, uh, and they had a house and a home in San Francisco. And so they would come back and his off season would train, um, train up with my father. And, um, you know, because my dad, you know, of course, when they all grew up, they were all, when they were young, they they grew up playing baseball. Um, and, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. Um, and in California, at that time, you know, they grew up in the projects. And and so, anyways, you know, fast forward, Tony made made the pros in the off season. Off season, he would come back to California and train. And then t- towards the end of his uh, his his career, I think it was in Japan. I, my brother and everybody else, they have better, I mean, a, a better recollection of it. But my recollection of, of that whole piece was was that he decided that, you know, he was going to hang it up and he decided to do the Roberto Clemente thing where he wanted to go back and take baseball back to the island. So um, he had one at one point decided that he was going to come to California and go with my dad um, just for a visit, just to see, you know, you know, the home that they were born and, and, you know, where they came from and they just fell in love. They returned back to the States and picked every, picked the whole families up and then went to Samoa. <laughs> and so, Wait, so who was in Samoa? Uh, I, who was in Samoa when uh, Tony and Ben and you, everybody else was in San Francisco? Uh, that, that point right there, I think it was uncle Tula. Uh, uncle Tula was in mm. Samoa. Oh. Sam- 
and mm-hmm. Uncle Milo at that time. And so, th- yeah, and, you know, and, and as far as their visit, the specifics of their visit, I, I don't remember. I don't know. I don't really know too much of that story. But I, what I do remember was when we all picked up from San Francisco and we just moved. Um, I was very young, probably three or four years old. Oh. And, um, and you know, when we got there, um, I think my dad at the time, I don't know if he would have gone if he wouldn't have gotten the, gotten the job. I, I don't know. That's, um, but, um, you know, he ended up getting that job at the Marine Railway, which kind of changed over to Southwest Marine uh, at the time. So my dad had a job to transition to, you know, from San Francisco down to American Samoa. And then, you know, that kind of made the transition for our family a little bit better. But, you know, so me growing up and, you know, and all that change, um, it was, it was a little different at the time. I, I, I barely remember it, but I do remember baseball. I didn't like playing baseball. (laughs) (laughs) It was, it was one of those things where, you know, because the family was going through it, you know, I ended up going through it and my dad wasn't going to really force me to play ball. It's just the whole family was involved in baseball. We were all going to the field all the time. So, you know, I mean, what was I going to do? I was just going to, you know, play ball and, you know, yeah, well, yeah, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't fully committed, you know, through baseball. I, I remember there were a lot of times we went to the field, um, and Baki was more of the athlete, you know, in our family at the time. And we would go to the field and you would play and practice. And my dad knew that I didn't have 100% interest in baseball. And he just saw, um, like, I, I think the the results of that, you know, ended up with me being benched a lot of times. And I just enjoyed being around. I, I enjoyed a lot of the camaraderie and just, you know, the friends that we How made old were you? through baseball. Um, how old were you when you guys started all going as a family? And how many people in the family went to the field? And um, how was that experience like? <clears throat> well... Well, we all went to the field, uh, dude. It's kind of hazy. I, I mean, it was around eighty-four, was eighty-five, eighty-six, was and there like was yeah, there was a bunch. People? Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I was young enough where I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really one of the main players at the time. I think uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure at that time um, it was Joe Salave and then you know, and it was their crew. Um, I don't remember too much of the names, but what I do remember was um, uh, I remember uh, the the Reeds, you know, Eugene Reed and them. I think at that point in time they had, you know, they, he was the coach of the Giants, and then you had the bro- the, the Reed brothers all playing over there. Then you had um, my father, I think it was the Padres. I think he had coached the Padres team and who, and what I remember was I wasn't old enough to be on any of those teams, but I remember the guys coming over to our house to sweep over. And, uh, it was, I remember it was Pule. I think it was junior. Selau. I think it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of, it was a lot of that crew. And, and, and of course, Baki was on the team. Um, a lot of the guys that ended but, yeah. up playing NFL football, right? NFL right and Joe Salave. So yeah, so this, the thing I remember about Joe Salave's story was uh, at that time Tony was was um, uh, he he took them out one year to uh, to Cal State Fullerton, I think it was, to where they played Cal State Fullerton, and then he had arranged um, to play some other teams out there because of course he was still well connected at the time. Tony was still well connected with a lot of those. A lot of um, like whatever coaches he was connected with, and then, and and I I think it was that year that they took um, Joe Salavet was on that team, and uh, I think that's where he actually ended up staying in the U.S. and and attended Oceanside High, and and that's when we saw like every summer there were sometimes some summers he would come back and play on Henry Henry Scanlon's team, you know, because I think the family. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I wasn't really serious about you know. My recollection is more of the uh, is is on the camaraderie, 
you know, that was formed throughout all the, you know, all the teams that, I mean, all, all the summers we played ball and, and, you know, and I wasn't that great. You, I mean, you know, when I, when I was growing up, I wasn't, you know, that great. I was the slowest dude, you know, I would look one way and throw to the other way. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was, yeah, but it was fun. You know, it was always fun being around the guys. Um, you could hit, man. You had a great bat, though. <laughs> Well, so, so, so over, over, over the years, I, I look back and I, I wish I could have taken it a little bit serious, more serious in my younger years. Um, because, you know, my development kind of changed over time. And I think what was key was having a guy like, uh, Ray Brown there. You know, I remember at the time, um, my, my father, like when he was, when he, when he ran the national team, I don't know if it was 94 or 95 when we had the Australians come down and we had a triple A tournament, um, back. It was one, I think it was one of the first triple A tournaments that we hosted in American Samoa in that, on that field. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, um, I, I don't know if that was, were you on that team? I was too young. <laughs> That was the old guy. That's right. Uh, Neil Annandale, Joe Pritchard, <laughs> yeah, and, all those big boys. Yeah. Oh, uh, was, was, was it Gabe in Poole? elementary? Was Gabe I was in Poole? elementary still. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. But you know, I remember that kind of inspired us some. But then, as far as my playing went, I think uh, when Ray Brown came out, um, I, I think the reason why my my assumption on why my dad brought him down was that. You know, he was busy with a whole bunch of stuff. Of course, my dad was, uh, you know, doing, you know, the, the, being the baseball president, but also doing the Fautasi stuff, and he was also busy with his work. Mm. And so at some point, I mean, like, you you know, you know you, you're doing everything. I mean, you really need somebody to focus on the program to kind of develop it a little bit more, and I think that's one of the reasons why um, why Ray Brown was there, was, was to bring – you know, a lot of organization and continuity with the program. And that's kind of where, um, that's kind of where the program again took off was when Ray Brown was there. He was a lot more serious about the development. I mean, he was primarily dedicated to that and he was very tough on a lot of us, on, on, on a lot of us guys, you know, and so with, with that, I think as he, you know, you know, when we talk about development, we don't not only talk about developing the players, we talk about developing, the, you know, you know, training the trainers, and that's kind of where we came in. Is we not only learned how to play, we also learned how to coach. Well, we learned the why behind what we were doing. We weren't just doing, and I think that's what Ray stressed a lot on us was, "Hey, dude, why are you doing that?" <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and so he would make us explain, you know, why we were doing whatever we were doing. If it was stupid, he would ask us, "Hey, well, why are you doing? Why were you doing that, bonehead?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. so. And, you but, know, as you guys got older, uh, you specifically, um, you went to Marist High School, right? Yeah. Yeah, I went to Marist High School. It was uh, myself. It was Ted, Jeff Felice. We had... Um, you guys um, had a good team, man. I think you you guys did we really a, well, like, almost every year you were there. Yeah, every year. Yeah, every year from 94 to, to 97, well, 93 90, to 97. 495. Yeah, 94 to 97 we uh we won every single uh we won the championship every year we were there. It was yeah. Yeah, we did have a pretty we had a pretty solid team. We had a Carl Farmer, yeah. I remember uh Carl Farmer was our was our coach and uh he was a pretty and he was a pretty good coach, you know, be it, you know, he was very <laughs> controversial at times, but he was a very good coach <laughs> yeah. for us. So I I think he got us through. You know, but then we also had some great players that were a lot of us were in the national team, and and we came through. But I think it was there. It was where uh, through that through that time where I I kind of took it took playing a little bit a little bit more serious with Ray with Ray Brown, and and he's he's the one who got me pretty much uh, um, obsessed about my hitting, <laughs> and yeah. so that's where I was. That's where I I picked up. Um, just an, I had an obsession on it. And I, I remember I used to take, uh, I remember at home, you know, when I was at home doing nothing, 
you know, I would just go in the back and take a, take a stick and, you know, like how we used to do those one hand drills, you know, I used to mm. take like a stick from, from the back of the house and, and you know, where we lived at, there was a waterfall behind there and all the trees back there. So I, I remember Samoa, we had plenty of rocks and then we had some sticks in the backyard. And so I would do the, you know, the one handed drills. I would throw the, the rock with my right <laughs> hand and, and then swing it and hit the rock with, uh, hit the rock with, the. Uh, with you know, with the stick in my left hand, and then I would switch over and you know do that, and then when I thought I was I was on point with my uh, hand eye coordination, you know, I would try to do it on you know on my left side and try you know and there was just you know what we do is we always imagine things, we always imagine you know situations, and that that kind of got us that that kind of got my mind you know my mindset, and I I was always visualizing. You know, like, hey, three and two count or, you know, whatever the count was, we just, we play that situation in our head and then we try to, you know, figure out, um, you know, figure out ways to come through in those situations. And, you know, sure enough, you know, if any, any of those situations present itself, it's nothing new to us. I mean, I was always preparing myself for that. And that's kind of, that's kind of what really got me into uh, what what got me in the whole you know, the, the whole hitting thing? I mean, if there's anything you know, I mean, if there was anything that I prided myself on, was it was my hitting. So that's awesome. Where so you took a stick and some rocks and you visualized and you did it day in and day out, and that's just kind of how you got better. That's crazy. I didn't know that. It was no, it was well, it was, and I was I was I was in my mind, I was obsessed oh. about it. I mean, it was it was one of those things where you know. Like it, it was one of those things where I've always visualized myself in key situations, and I just kept, you know, and and that's that's where my mind took me to, was that, you know, every single time, and you know, in the national, you know, and and so I took that to bat. I mean, like every time I went, you know, if it was a, you know, if 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 the game was on the line or something, and I had to go out and you know get a hit, that's pretty much what I thought about. A whole lot of times, and you had a lot of those situations in high school, huh? You came through a lot in high school. Yeah, I. You know what's funny? Um, the one, the only, the only time I remember was when there was a breakthrough. Was when I we had faced Leone, and I don't know if I was in the JV team or I was pulled up to the Vars and I played against, um, and then I was hitting against Ice. Mm. I, I, I hunkin and I remember that dude used to blow the ball right by us. I mean, he had the meanest <laughs> yeah. curves, and I was just like, he was one of the best pitchers. It was, it was a toss up between him and Ted, and Ted in his prime. Oh. But Ice was just so creative and so deceptive with his pitches, and um, he had the, I mean, he had the meanest curves. But anyways, it was, it was when we played Leonga for the first time, and I think that was when. For me, preparation that that opportunity to where, you know, I went out there and I tried to you know mentally get myself in. And I remember, and I remember before I went on deck, I was just timing his pitches, and I was trying to figure him out. And um, I think he had, he had, I think he had thrown a fastball and he was trying to blow it by me, and I timed his fastball and then I hit it out to left field. I think it was. And then I got the se- I, I either got the first or second. I don't think I was fast enough to get the second, but I think when I got the, I think it was first. When I got the first, I remember looking at Ice and he was just laughing because he couldn't believe that I hit him. <laughs> and, and so, but you know how he had that little laugh with the snort, <laughs> you know? Right. And so, and so, um, but he was such a good sport. I mean, he was such a good sport about it, but, um, uh, but that was the first time I felt like, you know, I felt like, man, I, you know, I can actually touch the ball, you know, I can, I can, I can kind of hang with these, with these guys. And so it was from then on was when I, you know, just continued on with, you know, with that confidence and, and just kept going with that. I mean, yeah, so. Yeah. And, and that eventually um, landed you a ticket off the island, right? Yeah, it did. Um, it did. I uh, um, eventually. Well, it was first. No, uh, first it was you, and I think. Um, and from my, from my perspective, I thought, 
um, when Hank Burbage discovered you guys out in Australia, you know, he saw your work ethic and the way you popped on and off the field. That was just so cougar baseball, you know, and that's something that that kind of aligned with, you know, his coaching philosophy and what he expects out of his players. And I always think, you know, and, and I thought, you know, at that time, he, he, you know, he was like, man, maybe I should go back and get me some more of these Samoan kids. <laughs> And so when he came back, he came back to our graduation and, and it was his first time. It was Coach Burbage's first time coming to, you know, coming out to to visit us, you know, and then he, you know, he came to our graduate with Ted and my, my graduation with Ted, you know, with Ted, uh, Gabe Oliver. And, and then he ended up riding with us. Uh, I think it was, he was riding in the back of our pickup truck. I thought he had a really, <laughs> he, he had a real big kick in that when, when this Balangi guy, coach from Michigan comes to American Samoa, you know, to meet his players, you know, he, uh, um, I think he got a kick out of the whole island life and, and, and how, you know, how we all interacted, you know, like he wasn't used to all the, you know, we had all these ulas, all these legs that we were putting all, all on ourselves during graduation. Um, I think he enjoyed the whole experience. And, and so, you know, we, that was our ticket. And of course, that was our ticket to, uh, you know, to Michigan, you know, to Spring Arbor University. And then we just, you know, oh, we all just started, you know, playing, you know, playing at Spring Arbor. And, and we did well. I mean, first year we won the National Christian College, uh, National, the NCCAA championship that year. And yeah, my freshman year, I think yeah, it was Yeah, that was a big deal. Yeah. Um... Right when when Coach Burbers went down to Samoa, that, I think that was a pretty big deal because that was in the past we've had other scouts come down and then they leave, but they just come down to train. This time, somebody from America came down and left with some players. That was huge. Well, you know what, Rob? I think that was at the point. I do think that was at the point though where I personally think that when our program, you know, it has its ebbs and its flows, but I think. On its research, on the resurgence of the program, I think that's where uh, that was probably a key time for him to actually come down. And I think, you know, the talent was ripe for the picking back then. Problem is, not everybody had an opportunity like Spring Arbor at that time. But, you know, I think I mean I think we're we're pretty blessed to have had somebody like him, you know, come down at that scene, that point in time to pick us up. Right. But, yeah. Right. I can only imagine. Um, your uncle's vision, you know, Tony's vision for the program. And I think he would have been extremely proud to know that, um, you know, people were actually getting opportunities to, to further their baseball career from the island. I think that's mind-blowing to me. We're such a tiny island. Well, and that was the intent, you know. I Well, let me, let me rewind back to when we were growing up. Uh, one of the things that I do remember about Tony was – of course, I was just a, we were all little kids just playing around. And but yeah. I remember in the evenings we would spend hours, dude. We would spend hours at the field, on end, like, and that was our place of duty for like the weekends, you know, Sundays. I mean, my grandfather was a retired flight guy at the time, and he didn't believe us being out on the field on Sunday. But we would find a way to sneak out there <laughs> on a Sunday, you know, to to play. But what I remember about um about Tony was that he had such a passion he like he had so much passion in the game and I remember after in the evenings when all the girls would sit there I remember him and he and my dad would end off the day and they were just sitting at the bleachers the sun was already set and they would just talk about Vili Fapoli and oh. just the passion that they had how like and I remember and then I didn't understand it back then but I do remember how they would talk about his quick release and they were just talking about the future. They saw so much potential in the kids that were there. I mean, they would, they would look at, um, they would talk about during the day, Hey, did you see, you know, Gabe Sewell die for that ball? You know, like, I mean, you know, they were just, they were just loving the development. They were loving, they were loving the fact that each year, you know, each season, you know, the whole program just, you know, it just went from, you know, from one level to the next and just the kids, you know, learning and just being excited about being there. And it it was just, you know, everybody rallied around him. 
and and it was just I don't know it was just a great opportunity to be there and to and to and and then again you fast forward you know you fast forward I think um to his death uh I remember when when Uncle Tony the, I, I it was it was shortly after I think it was Hurricane Ofa I think it was was when he got shot um there was a land dispute between um, between him and, um, and that land in Tafuna where the power plant is at. And so I, um, I remember that day we were all, we were, um, me and the, there was no power and there was, and the water wasn't running. So what we had was like the, this little creek in this, you know, that led from the, the, you know, that was fed by the waterfall in the back of our house in Muli. And, and, now I just remember my mom coming out there yelling at us to get, you know, get, telling us to get out of the water and, you know, we all had to get dressed. So it was, you know, it was, it was chaotic that night. And, and then later on that night, we found out that, uh, you know, that Uncle Tony even died. I mean, we couldn't believe it. I mean, it was, it was a time where, you know, he was at his peak in, in, in developing this, well, it wasn't really at its peak, but you know the, the the program was 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 skyrocketing, and then you had you know you just had this this dude just you know just kill him you know that day, and so it, it, it seemed at that time the whole reason you know our whole reason for being there in American Samoa, our whole reason for moving there, you know, was oh. kind of swiped out from under us, and so I think at that point. Um, and, and again, this is just my perspective, you know, and what I, what I've seen, uh, was that, uh, I think for a year or two, my father, um, didn't know whether to continue on with the program because that just ruined his life. My dad, I mean, Tony was born in 1949, 1947, and my dad was born in 1949. So out of the brothers, those two hung out the most growing up. And so... And so, you know, they did everything together. And so when he went, you know, when Tony wanted to go to Samoa, you know, my father followed suit and wanted to go to Samoa with him. And so they did a lot of things together. And then so it was at that time, like, I remember um, sitting in our house at that time. And my father just, I mean, he just, he just, he just looked lost. I mean, he was, he was just, uh, I mean, he was, he was mourning pretty bad. And he just didn't understand why there was a there was a moment at, there where you know where you just don't know you know how you know how the future is going to be with you know with with the family and everything. And so at that point, I think my dad kind of stayed removed from a lot of things, a lot of activities until like two years later. I think he came back and decided that he was gonna he, he was gonna invest his a lot of his time into the program. And then that's kind of where he engaged. I remember at the time it wasn't, he was there with uh, helping out with, uh, I think it was Speke on Hawaii. You had a lot of key people there that were a part of that, that were there to, to kind of try to keep the fire going, you know, when, you know, Uh after Tony's death, but it just seems like the, you know, it just seems like at that time, you know, the interest in the program wasn't, wasn't so much there because, you know, the the whole reason why, um, you know, why, why that whole fire sparked up in the first place was because Tony came out, you know, and, you know, to help, I mean, to start the program. And so I think my dad decided that he was going to dedicate his time to kind of help keep Tony's legacy alive and to keep it going because, I mean, and, and that's what, you know, I think he wanted to do for his brother. And so, so that's, anyways, so we went forward, then we went backwards. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the forward part was, uh, was key because you, you were instrumental, your, your grade level, even your high school was instrumental in raising the competition level just between us as players. Uh, but then, you know, with you guys getting better and better and then having the opportunity to go to college, I think that just, that was great, and I'm sure Tony Tony would have been proud. And I know for sure your dad was thinking happy as heck, man, um, at, with the direction the program was going. He was. 
Yeah. Yeah, he was he was very happy. Um he he and Ray would um yeah, Ray Ray was such a blessing to the program. Um just I, I mean just his personality. Um he he brought a whole lot of yeah, like I said, he brought a whole lot of structure and organization to the program. Uh, and something that we as Samoans need. I mean, like, like your, yours and and Joe's conversation was, you know, like, hey, you know, like your 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 butt's gonna be there at four o'clock. I mean, practice starts at four o'clock, and that doesn't mean you show up at four o'clock. You better have your shoes on, <laughs> everything on, to be ready yeah. to run at four o'clock. Do you remember there was one? <laughs> and I remember it was more than one of us, you know, that showed up late. And he says, "Why don't you go home yeah. to your mom or something?" Like that. <laughs> yeah. Why are you, going you know, to you know what you. Don't, <laughs> Yeah, why did you go pull weeds? You know, if that was so important for you, you think you're going to go do your fit? I was at home. Okay, go do your fit. I was at home. <laughs> and so, but you, you know, and the thing is, you learn once. <laughs> you know, you, you learn that lesson one time. Like, man, I'm not going to be late again. That's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> you know, the gate is locked. Yeah. You know, and everybody's ready, to, yeah. everybody's ready to work. And, you know, and that's why I, that's why I realized that, um, you know, for us, as Psalm ones, a lot of his teaching was really conditions based. Is that it, it's that like you better get it. You know, like we're not gonna we're not gonna finish this exercise until you're done. We're not gonna finish this drill until until you get it. And and that's what I loved about Ray. I mean, he's he was one of the key reasons. And as and and I look back to see how hard he was, and you know how hard he was on me. And mm-hmm. and and the thing is it. You know, it was all for for reason. It was all for a good reason. You know, and I continually, you know, message him here and there to thank him for, you know, a lot of the time that he's invested and he invested himself into us. And so that was, mm-hmm. yeah. And then, and then, you know, and then comes Coach Hank Burbridge. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was something else. Um, what's one of your most memorable moments in baseball in your entire career from little league to college? Um, what's the one thing that you remember the most, or it could be the top two or three or whatever, but. Honestly, I, you know, my perspective back then is a little bit different than my, my perspective is now. And I realized there's almost like a common, for me, there's a common denominator and everything that, I went through, you know, through all the struggles. And for me, the most, the thing that I most remember was, was, was my prayer life throughout the whole thing. And Mm. and that's, for me, that's always been, for me, that's always been the common denominator. Like I've always, I've always had a really, really strong prayer life, you know, maybe sometimes not the strongest, you know, you know, actions in my life, but (laughs) But I've always, you know, I've always, I, I remember there were key times in my life where there was, it was chaotic and, you know, I, you know, I've made it, you know, I made it intentional to pray to God for the resolution of something, you know, and so, but that's what I remember the most. And what was one of the things that I remember the most about that was, um, was in college, you know, we were in college and you know how I played, you know, like the first three years I didn't start, you know, and, and for me, that was, that was the most challenging thing that I've ever had to endure in college. And I had remembered at the time where in my mind, I thought, you know, I could, I could play, you know, like I could play and I could actually, you know, you know, there were times where, where coach Burbridge would say, you know, can somebody out here just tell me they want to hit and go out or go out there and play and, and, you know, and, and do something, you know, and, and I remember telling him, I was like, coach, you just put me in, (laughs) you know, like, and, and I remember not only I did that, I think I remember Ted had told coach, coach, I mean, Salah can hit, put him in. (laughs) And so I remember, I remember at that time I was, it was frustrating for me. And so, so my last year, you know, and my senior year comes around, and I'm questioning whether I should even be on the team or not. And I've even questioned myself and whether I should continue on. And I remember one night I went down to uh, – one night I walked down to the field and just by myself, and it was dark. It was, you know, at you know at Hank Burbage's field. And, 
And so I walked down there and I was just, for me, I just had my conversation with God. I'm like, like, God, I'm about to quit this baseball thing because, you know, you know, apparently I'm not good enough to play. And so, you know, like there's got to be some purpose, you know, that I have to fill on the team. And so I remember it was at that time where, where, you know, I sat there and, you know, I felt God speaking to me, telling me, hey, you know, you're on the team to serve, so mm-hmm. serve. <laughs> and so, mm-hmm. and so, so I was like, I was like, this is, for me, it's crazy because why, you know, I'm, again, I'm still on this team. What am I going to do? You know, I expect to be on the team to play. And so mm-hmm. that's what I did, my, you know, and so that fall, that's what I remember. And I don't know if you guys remember, you know, like there was a, that little foul ball competition, I decided, you know what, if there's nobody going to get these foul balls because we need, still need the balls for the game, I'm going to go out and get it, and I'm going to mark them all on my hat. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I did. You know, like after the games, I was there to help out with the field work, you know. And the thing, for me, it was more of, the, I, it must have been a combination of, you know, just listening to coach and, you know, having him talk to us about guaranteeing what you can guarantee and guarantee what you have control over. You know, just those little things that he talks about. And for me, it all, it all boiled down to, you know, just serving, serving our team. So, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember, you know, like even after the games, I would always go out and collect the bats. I wouldn't do, you know, like I wouldn't wait for anybody to ask me to do it. I just went and did it because I felt that's something I should be doing for my team. And mm-hmm. so for me, that was very, that was, but that was very key. I was very intent on not playing, but then I was there to learn to, you know, learn from coach, you know, on, you know, on coaching. And I realized that co- I think in a way coach was kind of, you know, kind of grooming me, you know, to, and teaching me how, you know, how, you know, with coaching and stuff, cause he would talk to me on the side here and there about, about, you know, some stuff and I would learn, he would give me, yeah, anyways. And so what I would, so we had, I think it was a, the trip in Florida, right? So here's here's me already convinced that I was not going to play for my senior year. And then we get to Florida, right? And we, I think it was Florida Atlantic was when we were playing. And I remember he had put me in at one time. And I was, and I think I remember you telling me that, you know, that I was playing good. <laughs> And I was, and so I, I think I, I don't know if you remember that game, but I remember playing well that game. And so coach had put me in a little bit more, you know, to play. And in my mind, I'm still convinced. I'm like, you know, in my mind, I'm like, God, I just, you know, was settled with just serving the team. (laughs) Now I'm playing. (laughs) And so, so, uh, you know, and but that whole year, I mean, it was just for me, it was just crazy because I wasn't expecting to play much. You know, I was expecting, you know, if at the first sign of trouble, I'm like, coach, just pull me out. <laughs> and I think I remember in Concordia, you guys were looking at me like, dude, what do you, you know, because I remember going out there, I was doing well, I was playing well, and then I think I like missed a couple grounders, and I'm like, man, I'm done. You know, like I just went out, like, coach, just pull me out. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Get back in the game, <laughs> yeah. and, you know. Like you and you and Ted are like you and Ted was like <laughs> like totally, <laughs> yeah. And, and so I, I was like I was like you know what, you know I. And so I, I think at that point in time I wasn't very uh, I don't think I was very self aware, you know, in what was happening around me. And 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 for me, I didn't I couldn't accept it. I I wasn't gonna accept that I was gonna be a starter, but it just kept happening. Right, he, he was just putting me in either at third base or at DH, and yeah, you know, that, my whole that game and, was funny, dude. That that scenario was funny. Yeah. I think you were three. For, I think you were three for three. You had made some defensive plays, and then um, if I remember correctly, during the infield, like you know, in between innings, it might have been later in the game. You missed a few of those ones, and then one ball uh, went by you during you know in in regulation. And you're like, okay, suck it, you know, suck it up. Get, and then another one went by you, and you just ran into the field. So here's, like, take me out. <laughs> so here's 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 one of the things that. So in the first three years, here's one of the things that we kept revisiting. I I think I had a torn. I blew. 
I blew my shoulder in my first year. I don't know if you guys remember that or knew that. I don't know if I shared that with you guys, but I blew my shoulder my first year. It was in pitching. And so for me, that shook me. And so like for the next week, I I mean, we're, we're Samoans, man. And like, we don't know anything about any surgeries or (laughs) Tommy John surgery. And so for, (laughs) so for me, as we, as we kept playing and I, in those first three years, I kept getting benched, you know, like my, I think part of it was my confidence because Remember when we would go out in the beginning of the season, my arm would feel great, and all of a sudden it mm-hmm. would just—I mean, it would just crap out on me. I'm just like crap. I mean, I, I could never like for me, you know, that that did something to my confidence too. And so, um, but it was just, you know, like I I didn't know what to do at that time, and and so there were times where I felt like oh man, my arm's hurting, you know, like, and I didn't want to really revert back to. You know, well, you're gonna suck at throwing, so make sure you roll the ball to first base. You know, it's just, I, I didn't know. You know, like I, so at that time, I, I kept some things internal, um, but there were some things where, you know, where I shared. But but here's the thing, Rob. Like over over the, those four years that we've been playing, uh, like I thank I thank you guys like you and Ted. You know that you guys have. I mean, you guys have helped me get out of that shell. You know, and it, it was it was more of a. I think for me that time with you guys, just spending that time with you guys, has helped me grow as a person. You know, because, you know, we were all away from Samoa, away from mm-hmm. conventional Samoan thinking, and so we all were there outside, fending for ourselves, being with us, you know, with ourselves, learning, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, learning how to be in in the United States of America with each other, and I think that was a. For me, that is, that was that was pretty key, and I, I get I don't know I don't know how it was for you guys, but for me it was a, a, a huge confidence booster to have oh. you guys around. Yeah, that was that was definitely formative. Yeah, transformative the, the, those years. It was, um, and and it's helped, uh, like you said, to be better people, better men. Um, so, yeah, dude, that's – and I'm sure a lot of the discipline you learned from baseball has helped in what you do now and how you manage your home and everything else, right? Well, it did. I mean, it opened, for me, it opened up uh, a little bit more critical thinking on why we thought the way we did um, because I remember, you know, I remember going back home you know, and learning a little bit of critical thinking from school, and then you have people from home saying, Dilly, you know, you come from the U.S., you know, you come from college, <laughs> you know, you think you're smart. <laughs> you know, and you're like, well, not really, man. I mean, you know, so we just go off and get an education, you know, and then what we don't want to do is come back and follow our fia <laughs> So, mm-hmm. but anyways, but when we – but that time with you guys and that time, you know, spending in, in, in a, uh, you know, in a, in a college atmosphere kind of helped open up my way of thinking, you know, into like more of a critical thinking and why I think the way I do and, and learning, you know, why I want to, you know, and, and I've changed over time. And so, right. yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's helped, it's helped me mature for sure. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that was yeah, that was that was college. You know, that was college for me. <laughs> yeah. But I but I but what I what I remember though, and there were little habits that I had in my senior year that I picked up in my senior year. It was um, with if in my hat. I wish I still had my hat. You know, I would have. I was trying to be the best foul ball getter. You remember that? <laughs> mm, <laughs> so we all started. Yeah. You know, we were all competing you know, for how many foul balls we get. So every time, you know, somebody hit a foul ball, you know, I would jump over the fence and run out, try to get the ball and mark it down the take on my hat. And, but in the corner of my hat, I always, I always put PGF. It always is put God first. And, mm. and so, and for me, that was always, that was always my thing. Before I went to bat, I was always, I would always draw a sign of the cross in the dirt before I actually stepped in the batter's box. And that was always my thing, you know, like before I went in, I always, 
drew a cross in the dirt before I stepped in the batter's box. And that's always, that's always remind me that, you know, like uh, is, you know, do your best as if you're doing for God, you know, and everything else will fall in place. And so that's kind of mm-hmm. my, that was my thing that helped me clear, um, that helped me clear the mechanism, the mechanism, you know, so that when yeah. I went in to hit, it was a clean slate. And so for me, I took that mentality, you know, in the, the South Pacific games and we went to South Pacific games, you know, I took yeah. that mentality with me. It, it was, it was, I went up through the sign of the cross in the dirt. I went into my, you know, I went and, and for some reason that just reset my mind and that reset everything for me before I went in the batter's box, you know, mm. to hit, you know, to hit. And so, but, um, yeah, um, my prayer life, that was a big thing for the whole, you know, for the duration of, you know, what I remember. And I, and I still take that. It's funny. I'm in the army right now and I still do that, you know, like in my first you know, army hat that I had in basic training, I would put PGS in there, you know, put mm. God first. And, and that's always something that I've always done, you know, throughout my career is I always, I always made sure I was intentional, intentional on my prayer life. And I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah. And then you met your wife at college and, Everything just kind of did, you know, from there. So yeah, that was one of the, yep, that was one of the best things, you know, best thing, one of the best things that's ever happened to me. I mean, um, I'm I'm glad that, um, yeah, I'm glad that I've met her. We've been together for 15 years, married, but we've been together for 19 years, you know, ever since college, and so she's endured this army life, and mm. you know, we got three kids now I got a 10 year old uh, girl I mean sorry a ten, uh, 12 year old girl uh, and a 10 year old boy David and uh, a three year old girl Talia and mm. yep we're out here at Fort Campbell North Carolina I mean Fort Campbell North Carolina that's Fort Campbell Kentucky <laughs> that was at Fort Bragg North Carolina um, before but you know we moved so much yeah. Yeah, it's not for everybody though. <laughs> yeah, and all uh all, all because of baseball. Yep, the journey that it's taken it you was. to to now, so Yeah. It it was. I mean everything we learned yeah. Yeah, everything we learned, camaraderie, um, uh, the lessons we learned about being a good teammate, you know, um you know, a lot of that was I mean baseball was foundational too you know, to who we are nowadays. So Yeah, isn't that awesome? Yeah, man, I mean it's <laughs> Yeah. And I, I can't help but be reminded of how Tony felt when he had that desire to go back to Samoa. And um obviously I'm sure his goal was to see more people uh experience opportunities to leave the island for a better future, etc. And and we're living it. We're living proof. So that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast, website, whole initiative uh, for Polynesian baseball is to continue that legacy and continue to tell those stories from different perspectives. Um, Yeah, so that uh, the the Tony Soleta legacy continues. So, uh, and you're you're a rich part of that history, I have to say. So, and we got to uh, experience and, and listen to your story. So I'm, I'm definitely grateful. And I'm sure a lot of other people that are listening are grateful as well. Good job, dude. <laughs> nope. Thanks a lot. No, and thank you for, uh, uh thank you for, uh, providing this forum because uh, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good that could, that could come from it. And a lot of kids could, uh, who are aspiring to, uh, be ball players when they grow up, you know, that's the, that was the whole intent. And yeah, to- uncle Tony would be very, 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 very proud to see uh, a lot of the fruits of his labor coming through. Right, right, including your dad, too, because he, he had the same vision, so um, just trying to continue in that that pathway that, you know, he, your your father said as well. So, well, it's, it's an and the thing is, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, and, and Rob, honestly, it's a lot of people. I mean, it's it's a lot of people involved, you know, with with providing their time 
you right, know, right. a lot of, you know, a lot of their time and resources to doing this. I mean, you got, um, of course, it was Tony and my dad. You got, like, Becky on Hawaii. You got Henry Scanlon. You got, mm. uh, you know, um, Eugene Reed. You have uh, Poyer Samuelu. You have, um, you know, you have a lot of the parents, you know, all, all your parents, right. man. I mean, the parents right. were dedicated, and they were all committed to doing this and sending their, you know, the Filiangas, the, you know, all them guys. And then, of course, Murphy Sua, you know, like, come and key, right. you know, and, and kind of building that bridge that bridge out in, you know, down in the West Coast and also helping out with, um, you know, with furthering our baseball knowledge on, you know, on competition, you know, how, you know, higher level competition happens, right. you know, and then, of course, you know, another big part is Ray Brown. I mean, there, you know, there's just countless, countless people who have, you know, who have helped. Of course, I don't know if you remember Isaiah Liu Flau too, and you remember that guy. Oh, and yeah, Diana. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know, Gustiana, yeah, Mike, Mike yeah. Liao. You know, you got yeah, Mike Manny. Liao. You have, who's yeah. that? Manny. Oh, yeah, Manny. Yeah, that's right. Manny and Tortasi. Manny. Yeah, you got Manny. Um, and Peter Misilani. <laughs> Peter Misilani. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Peter Misilani and then... You know, and now yeah. you got guys back home, and you know Vic. You know, um, then you got the Kings. You got that line Kildees, and then you got yeah. the Kings. Uh, Chris and Nick King. You know, those guys were just those yeah, guys were yeah, instrumental. Absolutely, you're right, man. Yeah, you're right. But, and this is um, Tony and your dad and Murph and all those guys helped to kind of lay the foundation. Um, but it's it really is a community cultural contribution. So you're right. Yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. But again, you know, I mean, then you have us. So you know, of course, you know, with this, you know. <laughs> yeah. And this is our little small contribution, man. Hopefully, this will take off and get more people um, aware and be reminded of our stories. But now can usher in the new generation. So this is good. Yeah, so, hey, man, appreciate it, and uh, yeah, appreciate it, and take care, my brother. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks. I'll let you know uh, uh, with everything else that's happening, but I think this has been good, and we'll let it fly, dude. We'll let it fly. Sound good? <laughs> All right, man. Hey, you can do a lot of okay. outtakes in this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right, love you, going man. live, dude. Raw and uncut, man. Okay, bye, Philly. Yeah. All right. Bye. <laughs> okay.